In this video, I'm gonna share with you 10 mind-blowing ways that ChatGPT can help you crush your Bible study. And I trust that by the end of this video, your mind is gonna be blown wide open as well. Okay, we've got a lot to cover, so I want to first and foremost begin with a few disclaimers. First and foremost, ChatGPT is not God. It is not the Holy Spirit, and therefore, there are times when it very well may be wrong, which is the reason why that leads me to number two, right? You need to make sure that you know how to study the Word of God for yourself so that you can discern whether or not the responses that you're getting from ChatGPT are accurate or not, which is the reason why we have our in-depth, robust, over four hour course called the Bible Accelerator, which is taught basically on a seminary level, but made very, very simple for people who don't want to go to seminary and still want to learn how to study the word of God. The link is in the description, but I will say this, that from my experience, I have found ChatGPT to not only be pretty accurate, but also very well balanced in the answers that it gives you. Second disclaimer, in no way am I suggesting that ChatGPT can replace a way more robust tool like Logos Bible Software, of which I am a strong proponent of. But as you're gonna see in this video, there are some things that you can do with ChatGPT that you cannot do with Logos Bible Software. Final disclaimer before we jump into the goodies is, ChatGPT is not Google, all right? It's not, you don't use it like Google. Think of ChatGPT as your personal research assistant, right? You're having a chat with ChatGPT. You're having a conversation, right? And so the more you put into it, the more specific prompts you give it, the more you'll get out and the better responses you'll get. With that out of the way, let's jump into the first way that ChatGPT can help you slay or crush your Bible study. And I'm going to call this summaries or outlines, right? So you'll see what I mean whenever we go to the prompt. So I'm over here at ChatGPT and I'm gonna type this in, summarize Romans chapter one in paragraph, let me see if I can type, paragraph form in under 250 words. Now, let's just see what it gives us back, all right? So sometimes it takes a second, but <laughs> as you can see here, it literally is giving you a summary of Romans chapter one in under 250 words. Romans one, written by the apostle Paul, introduces the letter by emphasizing his role as an apostle chosen to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. Paul expresses gratitude for the Roman believers, so on and so forth. You can pause the screen or pause this video if you want to and read the rest of it. But notice, Paul then shifts to highlight humanity's rejection of God's truth. He describes how people abandoned the knowledge of God and turned into literally a perfect summary of Romans chapter one. All right, but now let's give it a little bit more information. Let's say, uh, summarize, I'll, I'll say, this is great. Summarize Romans one again in under, excuse me, in under 400 words, but this time feel free to use bullet points. All right, here we go. Let's see what it gives us, all right? Wow, so if you're a bullet point kind of person, all right, look at this. And it's giving you more information because we said 400 words, right? So here you go. You've got 400 words of a Romans chapter one summary using chat GPT. Once again, you can pause this video and you can read it, but my goal here in this video is not to go through everything, but more low, more likely, or more so to show you how to do everything, all right? now. I'm gonna show you another little thing you can do. All right, so you can say, this is great, but can you summarize Romans 1 in paragraph form in under 250 words using language that a, ah, I mean, I'm not typing well today, using language that a fifth greater can understand. All right, now let's see what it gives us. 
All right, so now what it's doing, it's rewriting the first prompt that we put in, but using language that a fifth grader can understand. And clearly you can see that it is very different from what we put in at the beginning. So once again, this is the first way that ChatGPT can help you with your Bible study is simply with summaries and outlines. Remember, use this as a research assistant. Okay, so let's jump into the second way. And I love this particular trick that you can do with ChatGPT. And we'll call this reading plans, right? Reading plans. So I'm gonna type in here, create a seven day, actually create a detailed seven day reading plan for first Corinthians. All right, let's see what it gives us. All right, so it's giving you a very good, solid reading plan, telling you what you need to read every single day so that in seven days, you will get through the book of first Corinthians. All right, we're on day five, we're on day six, we are on day seven, all right? So look, you can create your own reading plans with ChatGPT, and you can really, really enhance your Bible study. Now, this is the one I like, okay? This is, okay, awesome. But now, transform this into a 31-day reading plan. Boom. You don't need to say 1 Corinthians again. You don't need to say that. It's smart. It's artificial intelligence. It knows that you want to do uh, 1 Corinthians. So, because why? This is a conversation. This is a chat, right? Think of it as if you were chatting with your friend. You wouldn't have to say, okay, do this again with 1 Corinthians. No, no, no. All right? So, now it's giving you uh, a 31-day reading plan, all right? tells you exactly what to do each day. It even went above and beyond and told me ex kind of a, a emphasis or, or a summary of what that first day is all about, all right? So now let's just do this, okay? Boom, this is great. Now for the first day, and you can do this for all the days if you want to, give me an example of how I can make this into more of a devotional plan, including the reading assignment, reflection, prayer, and an application, please. Too many Ps. <laughs> all right, let's see what it gives us. Now, once again, you can go through all 31 days and do this, but look at this. This is absolutely amazing what you, are you your mind blown already? Like, this is crazy, right? Look at that. It's giving you your Bible study for the day, and all you got to do is follow the prompts. This is absolutely amazing. All right, so the third way that chat GPT, and you're going to love this, can help you with your Bible study is commentary, Right? actually providing commentary on a passage of scripture that you are studying. So I'm going to put this prompt in here. I am studying the parable of the talents. Notice I don't have to tell it it's in Matthew chapter 25 versus, uh, I want to say 15, whatever it is. Uh, it knows where it is. It's smart. It's artificial intelligence. Provide a detailed commentary on this parable along with practical application for my daily life. All right, let's see what it gives us. All right, wow. The parable of the talents found in Matthew 25, 14 through 30 is a powerful story told by Jesus to convey principles about the kingdom of heaven, responsibility, and faithfulness. Here is a detailed commentary on the parable followed by practical applications. Look at this. It gives you a summary of the parable. It gives you a commentary, the master's trust, faithfulness and stewardship, fear and inaction, the master's response, redistribution of talents. There's the commentary. And then look at the practical application. Oh my goodness. Listen, guys, this is absolutely amazing. And this tool is free, right? You have no excuse for not having a Bible study where you can crush it, right? Okay, so there 
is that one. All right, now let's just do another one here while we're here. Um, I am studying the book of Jude. Don't need to capitalize it. Don't need to be any have any syntax or grammar. It knows what you're trying to say. Provide a commentary on this entire book, please. All right, let's see what it gives us. All right, man, look at this. Remember, Jude is only one chapter, so uh, it's breaking down this entire book of Jude right before our eyes. Wow. Starts off with an introduction where Jude introduces himself, right? And then the purpose and call to contend for the faith. Warnings from history. Jude provides historical examples to illustrate the consequences of ungodly behavior, right? And then a clear description of false teachers. Boom. Look, if you're teaching, if you're a teacher, which I'm going to get to in just a moment, spoiler alert, this is your outline right here. Like, this is it. This is how you're teaching your Bible study. The prophecy of Enoch, exhortation to believers, the doxology, and then the key takeaways. Spiritual growth, showing mercy, contend for the faith, stay vigilant. All right? This is absolutely amazing. All right? So that's the third way that you can use chat GPT to enhance your Bible study. All right, so the fourth way that you can use chat GPT to crush your Bible study is through word studies or exegesis, right? So you don't have to go to seminary anymore. Well, I shouldn't say that, right? Seminary will help you do some things that Logos and, and ChatGPT just can't do, right? Actually being able to read the Greek and Hebrew in their original languages. But if you're not able to do that, you've got technology, you've got tools that can help you with that, all right? So I'm gonna put in a prompt we're, guys, we're just getting started. This video is going to be amazing. We have we have the, we have so many good things coming. All right, provide exegesis for Romans twelve two, and provide a word study on the word transformed. You remember that that uh, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, so let's go ahead and see what it's going to give us. Boom. It's got the verse text. It Look, I didn't even ask it for the context. I didn't even ask it for the context, and it gave me the context, all right? So now it's given us a breakdown of the, uh, of the word, uh, of, the, uh, of the verse right here, uh, right there. Uh, Greek word transformed. It gives me the Greek word. Um, there it is. Root word, metamorpho, which means to change form or to be transformed. It indicates a profound change in appearance or nature. Look, I didn't even ask for this, but it told me where the word also appears in other, uh, I believe, don't quote me if I'm wrong, but I believe this might be the transfiguration of Jesus, right? Where Jesus transfigured or transformed. Don't quote me. Yeah, actually, there it is. Yeah, describing Jesus' transfiguration, right? So if you're trying to figure out, okay, what does this word in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 mean? He's, it's giving you other uses of this exact same Greek word, all right? And there it is. Now, I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to say this looks like a compound Greek word. Now, I know that because I know Greek, right? Meta morpho, compound Greek word. Now, watch this. Can you break down the two parts of this word and explain what each of them mean in the Greek language, please. All right. Now we're digging. We're digging. We're digging. The Greek word translated as transform is indeed a compound word. It can be broken into two parts. Meta, this prefix in Greek typically means after or beyond or change. It's used to denote a transition or transformation, in case, indicating that something will undergo a significant change from one state to another. So now you're getting your mind around this. You're like, okay, well, this is how I'm supposed to experience transformation in my life. Morpho, the root morpho comes from the Greek noun morphe, which means, to, which means form or shape. It refers to the outward appearance or an essential form that characterizes something. When combined, literally means to change form or to transform. It signifies a change in the essential nature or character 
of something or someone in the context, so on and so forth. All right, that's cool. Now let's do this. Uh, give me a word for word Greek exegesis of Romans 12, 2. Here we go. It's going to give you, look at that. It's going to give you, it, first of all, it spits out the Greek text. And then word for word breakdown in the Greek text. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Right? It's literally breaking this down. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is insane what this tool can do. All right? It's not done. It's not done. All right? It's giving you all the Greek, the translation, and the explanation. I didn't even ask for that. And boom, it's done. Okay? So have fun with this. Play around with this. But word studies and exegesis is the fourth way. We got six more, y'all. We're just getting started. All right? All right. So the next way, number five, is what I'll call context, right? As you know, it's important for us to study the context. I have a saying that anytime, anytime you take the text out of context, you get conned, all right? Think about that. It'll make sense, all right? But we don't want you to get conned, and we don't want other people to con you because you don't know the context. So let's just say, I'll put this prompt in it. I am studying Ephesians 5, the section that deals with husband and wife relationships. Notice I'm not giving it the text. It knows it's Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. I don't have to tell it that. It's smart. What is the biblical context for this passage of scripture? All right. So let's just see what it gives me. All right. So here we go. All right. And it is saying the section in Ephesians 5 that deals with the relationship between husbands and wives begins at verse 22 and continues through the end of the chapter. Here's a summary of the biblical context, all okay? right? So look at this. It's given me an overall context of Ephesians. It tells me that it's broken down into two parts. Half of the chapter, or excuse me, half of the book focuses on theological principles such as God's eternal plan of salvation and unity in Christ. That's true. Once again, I find this tool to be very accurate. The second half transitions into practical applications of Christian living. In this latter section, Paul emphasizes unity, love, and conduct worthy of the calling believers have received. The immediate context, believers being urged to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, so on and so forth. And then I didn't even ask for this. It gives me the historical and cultural context, all right? Household codes. I mean, this is, this is just a wealth of knowledge, all right? Um, okay, here we go. Relationship between husbands and wives, uh, the profound mystery and the conclusion. <laughs> Guys, th this is insane. No excuse for a lazy Bible study. No excuse for a Bible study that's not fun, all right? So there is that. Now, Let's keep going. Let's just say um, thank you for this. Now, let's just put that in there. See what they say. All right. You're welcome. Glad I could help. If you have any more questions or need further assistance, please feel free to ask. Once again, see ChatGPT as your personal biblical research assistant. All right. So I'm going to say, yes, there is something more you can do. I don't, you don't need to say that. I'm just having fun. Just having a conversation. Please Give me relevant cross-references for other passages similar to this one in Ephesians 5, 22-23, that will help me better understand the concept of marriage. Focusing, here it is, primarily in the New Testament. All right, see what it says. All right, here we go. Colossians 3. All right, 1 Peter 3. And, and look at this, guys. No, like you could be, you could have the, you could be using chat GPT and you could get lost in how to study the Bible just using this tool. And now you go to your Bible and, and, and you, you, you study this out. Now you got a whole theology on marriage. Okay. All right, cool. 
So the next way that ChatGPT can help you with your Bible study is if you are a teacher, maybe you're leading a small group, maybe you are teaching at your church, or maybe you're a pastor and you're trying to create a lesson for an upcoming Bible study. Cool, ChatGPT has got you covered. I'm gonna put this prompt in here. I am planning to teach a 30 minute lesson to teenagers on Daniel and the lion's den. Provide a breakdown of how I can teach this in 30 minutes along with a brief commentary on this story and some application points I can give them. All right, here you go. All right, so it's literally going to show you how to teach this. It's gonna even give you times, suggested times for how much time you wanna spend if you're trying to do this in 30 minutes, right? All right, so while it's, it's, it's uh, populating, I'm just gonna go ahead and read part of it. Objective, teach teenagers about the story of Daniel in the lines and emphasizing the themes of faith, integrity, and God's protection. Boom, there's your three-point sermon. Daniel had faith. He also had integrity, which is how he got thrown into the lion's den because they couldn't find anything against Daniel, right, um, to, to try to, other than the fact he was praying to his God, and God's protection. Help them apply these lessons to their own lives, particularly in standing firm in their beliefs amidst challenges. Boom. So begin with the five minutes of introduction. Look at this. I didn't even ask for this. Begin with an icebreaker question. Have you ever faced a situation where you felt pressured to go against what you believe? How did you handle it, right? So you can start with those things. Storytelling, all right? So retell the story for 10 minutes. Focus on these key points. And then provide five minutes of discussion. And then five minutes of commentary. And five minutes of application. Two minutes conclusion. And then closing prayer, boom, your Bible study is done, all right? All right? Okay, so now I'm going to come back and I'm going to say this. Okay, the commentary is great, but please explain this again using language that a fourth grader could understand. All right. All right, here we go. All right. I'm doing this live time with you guys. All right. All right, here we go. The commentary on Daniel in the lion's den for fourth graders. Wow. Can you see how it has already changed the language that's being used and put it in terms of a fourth grader? Daniel was a very smart and trusted man who worked for King Darius in Babylon. The king liked Daniel so much that he wanted to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. This made other leaders jealous, so they tried to find a way to get Daniel in trouble. But Daniel was always honest and did the right thing. The jealous leaders tricked King Darius into making a new law that said people could only pray to the king for 30 days. On and on. I want to teach you fourth graders, keep doing the right thing. God protects us, and don't be afraid to stand out. Blown. Mind blown. This, this is insane. All right? All right, so, all right, let's transition a little bit. All right, so let's just say you're preaching a sermon or you have uh, an illustration or you need some illustrations. All right, so let me just, let me just see here. Okay, this is, is great. But returning to the original audience, which is more of an adult audience, can you provide for me three sermon illustrations that may help me communicate this to my adult audience. Boom. All right. Wow. All right. Let's see what it does. All right. So there's a story about a lighthouse keeper who was given a certain amount of oil to keep the light burning, so on and so forth. The testing of the tea bag. When you place a tea bag in hot water, the true flavor of the tea leaves is released. The tea bag serves as a metaphor for our character. We don't know the full flavor of our faith until we're in hot water. In other words, 
adversity reveals our true selves. Bamboo versus oak tree. All right. So on and so forth. All right. Let me do another one here. All right. I'm studying 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection of the dead. Provide three sermon illustrations that will help my audience better understand this passage of Scripture. All right, let's see what it gives me. (laughs) Uh, The butterfly's transformation, okay, that's great. The seed and the plant, all right. And, uh, okay, the rising sun after the night, all right. Perfect. All right. So you can go on and on and have a good time with this. All right. The seventh thing that you can do is, and this piggybacks off of uh, the sixth one, visual images. So if you're a visual learner like me and you really want to visualize the Bible, ChatGPT can actually create images for you that will help you visualize the Bible. And you can use these in your PowerPoint or keynote presentation. All right. Let's put this in. Okay. So Let's return to the Daniel story, please. This was great. Now, I'm having trouble visualizing this story. I'm a visual learner. Can you, oh, I spelled learner wrong, but it doesn't matter because chat GPT doesn't need it uh, to be perfect. Can you create a 16 by 9 photorealistic image that will help me understand the story better and one I can use in my presentation and then explain exactly what everything in the image means or represents, please. All right. It might take a second to generate this image. So, Uh, I use this all the time. My team uses this all the time to create images for thumbnails and things like that. All right, let's just see what it comes up with. Wow. Now that is an amazing image right there, okay? And not only is it providing the image, it's telling you exactly what. So let me see if I can click on this. Boom. Wow. All right. And notice it says here, in this image of Daniel in the lion's den, several key elements help bring the story to life. Daniel kneeling in prayer. Daniel is shown kneeling in prayer with his eyes closed and hands clasped. This posture reflects his unwavering faith and trust in God, even in a dire situation. Lions resting calmly. The lions surround Daniel, but remain calm and at rest, signifying that they pose no threat to him. Their peaceful behavior symbolizes how God miraculously intervened to protect Daniel from harm. Beam of light shines down on Daniel through an opening above, representing God's presence and divine protection. It illuminates Daniel, highlighting his connection to God and reinforcing the miraculous nature of the story. Stone walls of the den are a convey confinement, so on and so forth. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. All right, so um, we're going to move on to number eight. Number eight is one of my favorite ways to use chat GPT for my Bible study. All right, watch this. I'll call this context, cultural cultural context, cultural context, all right? So if you've ever been studying the Bible and you're like, hey, you know what? I want to get some juicy details on um, um, studying the Bible, this, this passage of scripture. I know there's some cultural stuff that I'm not able to understand from a uh, a Western world type of mentality. I want to be able to understand this from a first century Jewish perspective. All right, so let's write this. I'm studying 1 Corinthians. What is the cultural context of this book and the city that may help me best understand? Uh, can't type. Any passage that I'm studying in this book particularly topics and passages around sexual immorality. All right, let's see what it comes up with. All right, so once again, understanding the cultural context is key because there's certain things that you and I just don't understand about the culture that 
the Bible was written in, all right? So look at this. Look at this. It gives the geographical and historical context. It talks about Corinth being a wealthy city, so on and so forth. The cultural and religious background, it's got a diverse population. The religious practices, it was home to numerous temples and shrines dedicated to Greek and Roman gods. The temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, was especially significant. It housed a large number of temple prostitutes engaging in sexual acts, was which considered so on and so forth. Uh, okay, uh, so on. And so issues in the Corinthian church, all right? And there is the summary right there. All right. Now, I, I, I'm not content with this. I, I need some more information. So um, what did sexual freedom in the city of Corinth look like during Paul's day? Because because I'm like, okay, sometimes chat GPT will give you an answer and, and you need some more specifics. You need more details. So you need to tell it, okay, this is good, but go into more depth on this. All right. All right, so during Paul's time, the city of Corinth was known for its sexual per permissiveness and lax moral standards, which were in stark contrast to the teachings Paul advocated, da-da-da-da-da-da, temple prostitution, Aphrodite, so on and so forth, public uh, acceptance of adultery, uh, so on and so forth, so on and on and on, all right? Um, so uh, this is absolutely amazing here. Uh, it talks about uh, sexual practices and slavery, uh, general acceptance, uh, all forms of sexual expression were, expression were accepted, uh, so on and so forth, guys. This is this is absolutely, absolutely mind blowing. All right. OK, awesome. Let's do it. Let's do another one. All right. This one is a good one. I am studying the parable of the Good Samaritan. Spell it right. Can you tell me all of the specific Jewish cultural norms that I need to be aware of that would help me read this, help me read this parable and understand it from a first century Jewish perspective? Okay, so you know the story or the parable of the Good Samaritan, all right? Look, boom, it starts off by helping you understand the general relationship between Jews and Samaritans so that when you come into this parable, you already have a framework for the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. Purity laws and pre-vite, excuse me, pre priest and Levite roles, right? So it's getting you to understand why the priest and the Levite did not want to help this man who was on the verge of death on the side of the road because there were laws in place that prohibited you from touching a dead body. And if you came in contact with blood, it would make you ritually unclean. And then you'd have to go through all sorts of different um, rituals in order to get clean. And it was just an inconvenience. It was an inconvenience. So that's the reason why. The priest and the Levite did not want to touch this man, all right? And also, there's some information about um, the danger of traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was notorious for bandits, and they risked being attacked. Hospitality. So it helps you understand that the Jewish culture placed a strong emphasis on hospitality and caring for those in need, which basically makes it even worse. So understanding how the, the focus of this culture was on hospitality really, really um, is the backdrop for just how egregious it was for the priest and the Levite to leave this man who was essentially trying to hang on for his life. All right, social hierarchy and religious status, the concept of a neighbor often referred to fellow Jews rather than outsiders. This parable challenges that notion by showing a Samaritan, an outsider, as the one fulfilling the role of a true neighbor. Implications of the parable, so on and so forth. Okay, awesome, guys. So this was number eight, all right? Number nine is a character study, right? So let's say you're trying to study the Bible by character. All right, I'm gonna type this one in. I am studying the life of Esther, and want to do a character study on her. Can you do a character study on her, including 
relevant, can I spell? Scripture references and practical applications for my life. All right, let's see what it gives me. All right, I mean, I hopefully your mind is blown by how you can use ChatGPT as a research assistant to help make your Bible study not only easier, but a whole lot more fun. All right, so here we go. All right, it talks about her courage, wisdom, and faithfulness, and it gives relevant scriptures, her back, the background in early life. Uh, so, it, okay, this is great. So you can go through her entire life, the background to her life, her early life, right? Uh, how she became queen, her courage in facing crisis, banquets and exposing Haman, the deliverance of the Jews, practical applications, so on and so forth. All right. Uh, okay. Let's just ask it another question. Why and how did Esther uh, become queen and what sp happened to Queen Vashti? All right, cool. So now ChatGPT says, oh, you want to know that? Oh, okay, cool. I'm going to throw in some details, all right? And it gives you exactly what happened to Queen Vashti, so on and so forth. They search for a new queen, so on and so forth. Guys, you, you can read this. You can pause the screen. You can do all this. You can take all these prompts, all right, and you can uh, do them in your own Bible study. Uh, so it answers my question about how she became queen first, and then what happened to Queen Vashti, right, so on and so forth. All right, so that's character study. And the last way that you can use ChatGPT for your Bible study is a topical Bible study. So let's give it this prompt. I am struggling, you're gonna love this one, to forgive people in my life. Did you know that? <laughs> I'm just having a conversation. I'm just having fun with ChatGPT. I wasn't aware of that, but I'm really sorry to hear that you're struggling with forgiveness. Forgiving, forgiveness can be challenging, especially when we've been deeply hurt. If you would like to talk more about it or seek some guidance, I'm here to offer support. Well, thank you, ChatGPT. Whether it's encouragement, advice, or simply listening, I'm happy to help in any way. Okay, well, thanks for listening. Well, I could use your help, actually. Cre can you create a topical Bible study? Let me see if I can spell. For me on forgiveness, including relevant passages of Scripture. I can't spell or type actually is the problem and include examples in the Bible of people who had to forgive and what I can learn from these. Wow. Let's see what it gives me. Absolutely. A topical Bible study and forgiveness can be incredibly helpful and comforting. Here's a guide you can follow. Introduction to forgiveness, the key passages, 1 John 1, 9, Ephesians 1, 7. In other words, understanding God's forgiveness first before you can forgive other people, the command to forgive people, biblical examples of forgiveness, Joseph, Stephen, Jesus. And then it even gives me this, practical steps to forgive, acknowledge your feelings, pray for guidance, release the grudge, seek reconciliation, find support, and a final word right there, okay? Amazing. Now, let's say you want to extend your devotion and watch this. It'll be the last one we do. What are a few good worship songs that I can listen to that will help me understand God's forgiveness and then perhaps also help me understand how to forgive others? Wow. We'll see what it gives me. So now not only have you had a Bible study, but now you got your devotion and you got your worship music forgiven by Crowder. How deep the father's love for us by Stuart Townend. Your grace finds me by Matt Redman. Amazing grace by Chris Tomlin. Forgiveness by Matthew West. At the cross, love ran red by Chris Tomlin. And the list goes on and on. Give, provide five more songs, please. All right. No problem. ChatGPT's got you. All right. Mercy, forgiven, 
grace to grace, scandal of grace, as you find me, so on and so forth. So guys, I hope you found value in this video. Have fun with this. My whole goal of our ministry is to help equip you with the tools and training that you need so that you can crush it for the Lord, so that you can make disciples. And it starts first and foremost with you having a consistent, vibrant Bible study, one that you look forward to and one that is fun for you, all right? And I believe that tools like ChatGPT are only gonna get better and better over time. But remember the disclaimer that I told you before, this is not a replacement for your Bible study. It is a tool. It is a supplemental tool that you can use to enhance it, but it should never replace you getting alone with the Lord, with no tools at all, how and, and, and just studying the Word of God. And that is the reason why we have our four-hour Bible Accelerator course that teaches you how to study the Word of God like a seminary student. The link is in the description. If you like this video and you want to see more like this, hey, let me know in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed this ChatGPT meets Bible Study Masterclass. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.